Welcome to more World Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and this video is a full review of the reward aircraft for Holiday Maneuvers 2022, the Northrop P61 Black Widow. Hello there. And those of you who've already celebrated Christmas, I hope you had a lovely time. And those of you who are, who are yet to celebrate it, I hope you will have a lovely time. And here, on in the snow, in this festive setting, is the Northrop P61 Black Widow. So called because it was designed as a night fighter and the livery was dark, uh, and therefore the name was coined for it. I haven't got that camouflage on at the moment, although we'll discuss that later, and there's a reason for that, as you'll hear shortly. Um, the aircraft was primarily designed um, to replace British equivalents, the Mosquito comes to mind, and initially was met with some disfavour, it was felt to be too slow, but served eventually in the European th theatre, um, in the Italian theatre, Mediterranean theatre I should say, CBI theatre, China, Burma, India, and the Pacific theatre, I think it's fair to say without particularly distinguishing itself. Um, Anecdotally, it's credited with the last kill of World War II, although it wasn't strictly a kill. In the game, it has some interesting features. This is the dorsal turret here, featuring 50 cal machine guns, I guess, M2 Brownings, I would have thought. This can fire in any direction, including forward, which means that occasionally it will engage aircraft that you're in a tight turn with, helping you damage them, possibly even critical them. The forward firing weaponry is quite hard to find, and here's the reason why I have this luminous ca camouflage on. So we can zoom in, and there you see, obscured by the bay for the front wheel, 20mm cannons. In the game, the thick aircraft is fairly slow, has fairly low DPS, but is highly manoeuvrable. In fact, it's going to outturn some of the multi-rolls in the game. Um, and also, uh, those of you who are particularly enamoured of the XP-58 are going to have to watch out for this plane because it's going to hunt you down mercilessly if the pilot knows what he's doing. Let's take a look at the details of the aircraft. That's coming up in a spreadsheet, which I'm about to show you. If you don't want to look at that spreadsheet, although you'll be missing a lot of good stuff, use a link below to skip ahead to another part of the video. Here we have the spreadsheet for all of the Tier 8 heavies. The Black Widow is in columns C and D, and if you don't know how this spreadsheet works, I do have an instructional video Link is below in the description. Please go and have a look at that and you get the gist of what's going on. Let's look at the business end of the aircraft. And the rating for the guns is 30 and the cumulative DPS is 480. Not good news in theory. If we scroll down to the worst in class figures, you can see that that's third worst in class rating and second worst in class cumulative DPS. However, that's not the end of the story. Wait for it. There'll be more interesting observations to come. Also, it's as bad as the F-82 twin Mustang, and I haven't actually heard people saying that they can't get on with the machine guns and the lack of firepower on this aircraft, although, to be fair, it does carry ordnance, uh, which means it has an extra dimension uh, that it can uh, be used for, um, which the Black Widow cannot be. So, what do we have as forward-firing armament? We have four 20mm M3s with 120 DPS each, Rate of fire 420, relatively good range of 2,493 feet. And now let's look at this information here. Auto aim angle, three degrees. The amount you can be off target by and the game will correct your aim for you. Three degrees is very good. If you look at the rest of the figures, you will see that that's as good as anything uh, on cannons in this particular comparison. And then the dispersion angle, the way the shells uh, spread out as they leave the muzzle of your gun. 0.4 is excellent for something that is not a sniper cannon. This is good news. And then the overheat time is a splendid 12 seconds, longer than any other cannon in this game, uh, this comparison. And the shell velocity is high, 1,604 feet, which means that you don't have to have enormous lead to, in order to hit your aircraft. The shorter the lead, generally the easier the gun is to use. So although the DPS and the, and the rating may be low, the accuracy of these guns is something to be desired. It reminds me, in theory, of the guns on the Pancake pre-nerf back in 2018. And if you work on the accuracy, you can achieve some fairly spectacular results with this aircraft. Gun armament also includes defensive armament. That's that turret on the dorsal turret that I mentioned. Now, it's listed as one 12.7mm M2 machine gun. You can see it's four in the model, but that's just the way that the World of Warplanes team, World of Warplanes team puts the information into the game. 
It's got 128 DPS and a range of 2297 feet. It's as good as the turrets on the XP58 chain lightning and the BVP203. However, I wouldn't rely on this to try and get rid of aircraft behind you. You want to try and flee, and I'll show you uh, why you should, uh, how you can flee most effectively in a moment. Come to ordnance, we can forget ordnance. The Black Widow has none, and I regret that actually. But uh, there you go. It's purely an interceptor. Uh, and a destroyer as opposed to a ground attack aircraft. Survivability is excellent. Highest in class across the board. 21 rating, 700 hit points, which is as much as two of the tier 10 heavies, incidentally, the XF-90 and the ME-262 HG-3. Excellent fire, a damage resistance of 73 and a high fire resistance of 8. This is good news. It's a robust aircraft. Airspeed, not such good news. It's not particularly outclassed by the other heavies, but it's not fast. And do pay attention to the cruise speed, 347, and the maximum boost speed of 435. If I've dropped into the worst-in-class figures, you'll see that that is the second worst-in-class cruise speed and the worst-in-class boost maximum, maximum boost speed. And the dive rate is okay at 559, but it's certainly not first in class. However, what is first in class and displaces the BBP203, which has 40 seconds of boost, is the 60 seconds of boost. And this means that this aircraft is going to be able to pursue almost anything, certainly other higher um, um, heavy fighters. And even though they'll initially get away potentially with faster speed, they will run out of boost. And if you're determined and the pilot isn't clever enough to fly into a sector where he'll get help from bots or other friendlies, you'll get them. And you can see now why I said that the XP-58 is under severe threat from this aircraft. Get on the tail of an XP-58 and all you have to do is chase it down using that boost and you will catch it up and then you will destroy it. Maneuverability, also excellent. Best in class rating, 53. Best in class time to turn, 360 degrees of 12. And I'm not going to show you it, but I can tell you that that will... Um, outturn several of the multi-rolls in the game. For instance, the ME109TL, the XP72, and it will go up against uh, aircraft like the F2G and stand a chance of outturning them if the pilot doesn't know what he's doing as well. It's a really manoeuvrable heavy, this. The roll rate isn't very good, though, although it's listed here as second best in class. It's only 90. Minimum opt optimum speed of 278 and maximum optimum speed of 486, giving a range of 208 miles an hour in which your characteristics do not degrade. Stall speed is 99, which is manageable. Second best in class, in fact. And we come to the altitude performance. And although almost all of the aircraft, with a few exceptions, have good altitude performance in this comparison, it's certainly uh, no worse than any of the others. It's equal first on rating along with the Dornier 335 file and the ME262 and equal first with those aircraft in terms of the maximum optimum altitude and the ceiling. The climb rate is a, a second best in third best in class, I should say, um, 434. Um, possibly some people may try climbing away from you. I think this is good enough with the range on those weapons to stop them from employing that as an escape tactic. Now, the power to weight ratio, treat these figures with care, but they are perhaps an indication of acceleration within the game. Now, unfortunately, we don't know how drag is implemented in this game. We don't know if it's implemented at all. If it is implemented, we certainly don't have figures for it. But on the face of it, um, kilowatts per kilogram of point, nearly 0.25 is third best in class. This aircraft, in theory, should be able to accelerate fairly quickly. Uh, the twin Mustang, in theory, should outperform um, it on that score, and so should the BVP203, funnily enough. Um, for those of you who use motorcycles, particularly in the US, you may be more familiar with the rate, um, the, 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 the concept of removing a, power, a weight in order to get a, a virtual HP. Uh, and in this case, you'd need to remove 6.6 .6 pounds to gain a virtual HP. That's another measure of the same thing. But in theory, it should feel that it isn't sluggish under acceleration, even if it's not a particularly fast aircraft overall. If we go down into the worst in class figures. We've already talked about arm armament. We already know there is no ordnance. Um, the rest of these figures here, I've already pointed out the air speeds, particularly the cruise and the boost maximum speed. So watch out for those. Uh, there isn't anything else that we need to comment on here. So there's something else that you're going to need to bear in mind, but you're probably not going to want, and we'll see that shortly um, when I show you um, the configuration of the aircraft. 
you're probably not going to be building this aircraft as a speed merchant. And for those of you who like fast heavies and like speed builds, you may be disappointed with this aircraft. For those of you who fly like your heavies a little bit like your light fighters, this is the aircraft for you. This is going to be a really easy aircraft to fly. It's going to be very competitive against many of the aircraft it's going to encounter. Um, and it's going to be a nasty surprise for uh, some of them as well. And that XP-58 is looking um, as if it might be past its sell-by date if lots of these start appearing in the game. Okay, that's enough on the numbers. Let's go and see the configuration of the aircraft and how I've set it up. Here we are back in the snow with my P61 and the first thing to say is that mine is specialised which means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. Let's see what you'll be missing when you first get this aircraft. I have it in stock configuration at the moment and as you can see of the five equipment slots one is missing off the airframe, more on that in a moment, and one is missing off the airframe also for the consumables. But I want you to note the configuration here, it's unusual for heavy aircraft at tier 8. Normally you get either two engine slots and only one airframe slot or you just get one for each. This is unusual in having two airframe slots and immediately those of you who like your speed builds with an uprated engine and a boost mixture injection system you're in trouble here because you can have one or the other. That may call you, cause you to grind your teeth a bit. Let's pop this back into specialist configuration and we'll see how I've set it up. Whilst I'm doing that let me just say that there's a link to my live stream recording from yesterday of the P61 and in there I go through several different builds in quite some detail. Maneuverability build, two speed builds and also a tank build which I'm not sure many people will employ but it's there for reference and if you want to see much more about potential builds and options do go and have a look at that video. Here I'm only going to discuss the build that I've opted for which is a maneuverability build blended with a little bit of speed. So we've gone for a gun sight and I've got an experimental gun sight and immediately I've gone to inflict critical damage which I think is a thing in the game at the moment and because I'm getting critical so much I want to try and do that to my opponents as well and at least hamper them as much as they hamper me by their single shot taking off my tail or taking out my engine. And I've also gone for 5% accuracy when moving, firing at moving targets. The other options there, a 7% chance of causing critical damage which obviously isn't as good as 10% so reject that one. 10% chance of causing fire. I left that to one side. I'll see why in a moment. Uh, and then there's another 3% accuracy when firing at moving targets. Now I've mentioned that these guns could potentially be like laser pointers if you're going to maximise the accuracy. And in the past I would have, to be fair, then you would have picked off that 3% accuracy when firing at moving targets instead of one of the other, um, one of the two 10% uh, chance of inflicting critical damage. Going with the maneuverability build blended with a little bit of speed, I've got a lightweight wing frame. If you have an experimental piece of equipment uh, or a special project piece of equipment, mount it on this aircraft. I will tell you now that if you do all the things you can to improve maneuverability, which would include not mounting a polished skin incidentally, you can get that maneuverability figure up to somewhere around about 72, which is phenomenal. Um, but if you haven't got experimental equipment and you haven't got uh, uh, stock, uh, special project equipment, in most cases against most players, the standard lightweight wind frame suitably configured will be good enough. Notice though I have gone to the, uh, the trouble of nearly fully calibrating it. And I picked off all the bonus characteristics that improve maneuverability and rejected all the ones that don't as you can see there. Now I have decided to put a polished skin on. If you really, 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 really want to improve maneuverability you're going to have to make another choice here. But I feel that the aircraft is a little bit slow and therefore I'm blending the maneuverability with a little bit of speed. I did have an experiment piece of equipment lying around so I've employed it on this aircraft. Uh, I haven't fully calibrated it yet so there's more to come but of course if I calibrate it more then the maneuverability will be degraded a bit more so maybe I'm not going to do that. Don't know yet. And I then picked off bonus characteristics there. Uh, I need to reconfigure this because there's your maneuverability and 1% maneuverability in turns that I can have. I won't do that now, but certainly after this video I'm going to recalibrate, pick up those two bonus characteristics and then probably retain the maximum speed with boost activated um, as the third characteristic. And then continue with the theme of the maneuverability build, I've put on a lightweight power unit again, try and use experimental or stop uh, special project equipment if you have it. 
and on here the bonus characteristics I've picked off the your maneuverability which is the only one that affects maneuverability are, are amongst these bonus characteristics and then I've gone to improve the resistance to critical damage by 5% Still kind of find that engine being shot out an awful lot, I'm afraid. That's just the way the game is at the moment. The criticals have been turned up to um, unbelievable levels. And that's coming from both bots and the new players coming from the game. Um, and then acceleration with boost activated. You have their cruise speed. If you prefer cruise speed, you can pick those two bonus characteristics or acceleration without boost. I have chosen to mount gas operated action because it's a low DPS at aircraft and I had an experimental piece of equipment lying around anyway. Um, if you put on long gun barrels and some of you will, the accuracy will serve you very well and you'll be able to get that um, range out to something like 2900 feet, maybe even a bit more. And those of you who like shooting at range and are good at it, I'm not one of them, you might consider doing long gun barrels here and of course long gun barrels I believe don't affect your accuracy whereas experimental gas operated action does. Nevertheless, I have gone to pump up the DPS. You'll see the effect of that shortly. And I've picked off a chance of causing um, a fire, which is why I didn't put it on the gun site I mentioned earlier. 10% um, there. I've gone for the 5% damage inflicted by forward firing offensive armament. Regrettably, this is not available on a standard piece of equipment, but that's why I've mounted the um, uh, experimental gun so uh, uh, gas operated action equipment. And then 10% cooldown. Um, improvement uh, on the weapons after overheating although if you overheat these weapons you've got your finger on the trigger too long okay consumables the survivability is excellent as i've mentioned in the number section so straightforwardly and this would be the case even if you uh, mount an, an upgraded engine your um, survivability figure uh, and resistance to fire is still far high enough to um, uh, allow the amounting of the first aid dressing package again on the theme of maneuverability I've gone for pneumatic control assist for a tight spot in a tight turn with something that's uh, uh, is turning as well as I am. And then if I get my control services shot off, I can repair them once as well. The other option is an exhaust bleed inerting system. Since this is already a very robust aircraft, I don't think there's much call to mount one of those. This is one of the few aircraft where I do not mount engine cooling to give me another 10 seconds of boost i've already got 60 even with a boost mixture injection system i would still have something like 53 probably certainly above 50 i strongly recommend you put on the engine restart here um, if you are trying to get a speed build on this aircraft then your option will be the improved mixture control or the anti-oxidizing additive it's up to you but in all other situations, put on the restart. And I promise you, because of the amount of criticals in the game at the moment, you're going to need this restart a lot. Ammunition. I'll talk about gold in a moment. I've changed my philosophy on ammunition recently because of the amount of criticals in the game. I think you'll do um, fine with universal ammunition if you can't afford gold, so don't worry about it. But if you are going to mount gold, then put on the fragmentation um, ammunition and, and inflict more critical damage. That would be my recommendation. Um, I would tend to suggest that you use incendiary ammunition when you've got machine guns on a plane. Okay, I think it's time to discuss pilot skills. This aircraft is currently a reward aircraft. It will be a premium aircraft or available in a crate, I guess, in the future. And therefore, you can train your crew from other planes and get an extra 20% when they're in this aircraft in battle. That's a good thing. However, some of you may think that this aircraft is worthy of a dedicated crew, and I would probably tend to be amongst those. I might very well choose at some point to build a pilot and a gunner specifically for this plane. However, for the moment, I've popped in my XF-90 pilot, the Tier 10 American Heavy. And the reason for that is because that happens to have the two skills here, aerobatics and aerodynamics expert. Now my pancake pilot, and I mentioned the pancake earlier in the video, of course, has a marksman three skill marksman two skill as well but it doesn't have the aerobatics expert um, skill however that would also be a good choice particularly if you're um, keen on improving the accuracy of your guns but if i were building a pilot specifically for this plane what would i do well with this maneuverability build i would concentrate and assuming you mount the equipment which, uh, at tier eight i think you pretty pretty much have to um i'd get these two skills first this one first, aerodynamics expert, which will only take effect if you have equipment, and then aerobatics. If you don't have equipment, 
Okay, go for aerobatics expert first because that doesn't need equipment mounted to take effect. And then I'd concentrate on this block here. Marksman 1, Marksman 1, Engine Guru 1, Marksman 2, Engine Guru 2. And I'd probably do it in that order as well. For the speed build, drop this skill and get this block as quickly as possible um, after you've got an aerodynamics expert. As far as skills way in the future are concerned, if you go for a maneuverability build, there is an argument for trying to get evasive target, which will reduce the amount of damage you, know, you take when you're in active dogfighting combat. It's an excellent skill for fighters, of course, but this maneuverability build might just tip you towards doing that as well if you're particularly going to take it into dogfights a lot. If not, then probably get cruise flight first, then drop that and then get um, resilience. That would be my favourite way to go. And if it's going for a speed build, you'd probably do the same. I wouldn't worry about the evasive target. Get these two. Um, once you've dropped this one, get that one, um, the resilience, and then go back and get cruise flight again. Okay. All of that equipment, consumable choices, bonus characteristics, crew skills. Let's go and see what effect that's had on this aircraft with post-build effects. Here we are with the workbook showing most of the effects of the choices I've made for equipment, bonus characteristics, consumables, crew skills, and of course the category of the equipment, whether it's special project, experimental, or just standard equipment. What we have in column C and D are the base figures, which you've seen before if you watch the numbers section. And here we have the effects. Absolute numbers in this column, and then in green and red, adverse or favorable effects expressed as differences and percentages. Start with the gun armament. We can see that um, the rating has gone up to 37 from 30, 23.3% increase. And the DPS has, in theory, gone up to 599. I'll explain why I say in theory as a cautionary note in a moment. The rate of fire has gone up by 18.8%. So that takes it up per gun. That takes it up from um, 420 to very nearly 500, as you can see there. And here we have the DPS. Now, the UI lists the effects separately and implies that they're additive and they are 18.8% rate of fire, as you've just seen, plus a bonus characteristic for 5% and that adds up to 23.8%. Well, if you increase 480, the base DPS by 23.8%, it's not 599, it's around about 570. So what's going on there? Well, the UI calculates it uh, by first applying the 18.8% to the base DPS of 480 and then the product of that calculation has the 5% extra damage um, applied to it as multiplicative. It's not clear in the UI. I'm not sure which is true. Either way, the story is that there's a significant increase in DPS. We've also been able to improve the auto aim angle. That's gone up to 3.15. It was already very good, 5% increase. If you really concentrate on this aspect, pick off the right bonus characteristics, etc., you can get that up somewhere around about three and a half degrees, which is splendid. I've managed to narrow the cone in which the um, the shells spread out from the muzzle of the gun to 0.326 degrees. Again, if you really concentrate on that, you'll be able to get 0.3, maybe even less. Um, and there are some other effects which I've just listed here. I've got a 20% better uh, chance of criticals, 10% better chance of fire, and a 10% increased cooldown rate of the guns if you overheat them. Shouldn't overheat them, though. 12 percent uh, 12 seconds burst is a long uh, burst. There's no effect on the absolute figures of the turret, but I have just listed here that you've got 50% more chance of criticals, and you've also got that 50% better aiming speed that I mentioned. And since this uh, turret fires in a wide arc, I think that's a really good skill to have. Now, there are adverse effects on survivability, and there's more to it than what you can see here, but you can see that we've lost two hit points, 9.5%, uh, and that translates as 49 uh, hit points as well. That's coming from the lightweight wing frame. Um, However, you've also got other effects which I haven't listed here because there's too many of them. They're, for instance, your wing, wings are more likely to take critical damage. Your pilot is more susceptible to injury. Just bear that in mind. Survivability uh, has gone down with this build. Airspeed, there is an improvement of 6% for uh, rating points to 71. That's coming from the polished skin largely. And that's taken, in theory, the cruise... Uh, Cruise speed up to 386 miles an hour from 347, 11.1% increase. And the boost speed has gone up to 450 or uh, as near as damn it. 
3.4% um, increase. So we've got a little bit of an improvement on speed as well, and that's good news. There's a very good improvement on maneuverability, and this isn't the full story either. It's gone up from 53 to 65. If you are careful with your choices, category of equipment, probably special project equipment or experimental equipment if you've got it, drop the polished skin um, to uh, remove the adverse effect on maneuverability, really carefully select those bonus characteristics, and you know that I've got two more to select on the polished skin, which will improve my maneuverability a little bit more as well. You can get this figure up to 72 reported by Flying Dutchman of Twitch or Marco Visser on YouTube. Thank you very much for that information, Flying Dutchman. Here we have a 22.6% increase um, on the rating, 11.18% uh, uh, increase on the turn time, which in theory is 10.66. The UI listed at 10.9, and I'm not sure why. And then a useful increase in the roll rate to nearly 115, 27.4%. And finally, coming from the polished skin, I expect we've got a 3.5% increase in the climb rate to 449. That's how I took this aircraft into battle. Let's go and see how it did. The map for the forthcoming battle is Plateau. It's the decisive hour variant. It's a five sector map with the five sectors in the roughly in the shape of the five spots of the die. And what we have is a central garrison, tactically important because it allows easy access to the rest of the sectors uh, in a line of garrisons, um, two on the uh, one axis here and then on the other axis we have the strategically important sectors the air bases which allow spawning near a certain garrisons uh, as well as giving you the standard three resources every five seconds you can as i've just said spawn there you can change your aircraft for one of the same tier if you're destroyed or you can get full repairs and the way to win this battle well before the cis players join the server anyway would be to try and hold your local air base your local garrison and the middle garrison and use that as a springboard to try and take if not the air base then at least the enemy garrison of course with the cis players i'm tempted to say that you swarm to your nearest sector take it and swarm away to whatever is the next sector and keep on doing that ad infinitum because that's how a lot of these cis players play uh, and that rather negates good tactical play we look at the order of battle we can see that we have a one extra tier eight i've got an f82 twin mustang with my p61 then we have lots of bomber spam three bombers two yunkers at 288c and tens again this is a feature of cis play they love to spam their bombers and ground attackers talking of which we've also got a me329 and then we have a single tier seven the p51 on the enemy team they have two rb17s and two il20s we've then got uh, also a specialized p61 opposing um, us and then they have the two tier sevens the key 84 and the p47n see how this battle developed as we go into battle here let me mention that this is a natively recorded uh, replay file and not a win uh, wall to wall planes replay file that means that the video may be a little bit jerky but the reticle will be spot on you'll see where i'm aiming and we're off to the airfield strategically the most important sector nearest me and then we'll see what develops from there so we're looking for the heavies any altitude uh, straight away so we can basically look down on everything and assess the situation advantageous position The air defence heavies are diving, so I wonder for a moment which target to go for, then I do select one of the heavies, and quickly I turn on it. And the improved DPS, it's no bother knocking down that heavy. Now we're looking for the second one. Get that, now I'm aware of a threat, have a quick look. It's not a big arrow around my plane at the moment, but even so I'm going to go and look for it. We've got the airfield anyway. It's an XP-72. I can outmaneuver this. I can chase it down. Basically, it's dead. Why did I do It's my shots, which I don't. And that's taking me towards the middle. And immediately, I see the opposition P-61, and I'm in an advantageous position. I want to make use of this position straight away. He's busy fighting another aircraft. I get behind him. I'm out of uh, sniper mode. And they take the sector, but I remove them from the game for 20 or seconds or so, which is helpful. Some good shots into the multi-roll. to go up and turn. It's the XP-72. 
Now I should be able to finish it off. I don't need to, so now I can turn for the next target. And we're four sectors to one down. Well, in this modern era with the CIS players, that doesn't necessarily stand for much because the CIS players are probably not going to defend those sectors and it could very well turn on its head. Get behind the F4U-4 bot. Kill that. I'm looking at the minimap here, assessing my options, and I found a bomber. And actually what I had spotted was the bomber was over the garrison over on the extreme left, and I flew over here deliberately to intercept it. And the RB-17 and the P-61 are my... RB-17s, I should say, and the P-61 are my primary targets here. So that's one RB-17 down, and then fortunately I find the other one flying into this base. And as you can see, there's no problem taking the RB-17s with this particular setup. Be a little bit more cautious about taking on B-29Cs. That's a whole different story, but there aren't any in this particular battle. For an XP-72 bot to dispose of again, and I do. Minimap, see what's coming in. There's a Grand Attacker. Also a good thing for this aircraft to pursue. It tends to be... it is a human player, so I'm going to take get some altitude first. And then I see a bot behind him, and it turns out not to be a bot. It's a human, and he gets me with a rocket rather luckily. So we spawn back in at the airfield, and the first thing I want to do, if I have to, is take care of the human that's just shot me down. However, there's a meteor nearby, I can't let that go on my tail, I'll turn it, destroy it, and I immediately find an RB-17 back in at the base. So for the second time, I get to shoot it down. There we go. And the human player in the uh, multi-role has been disposed of by someone else some time ago, I presume, so I'm going to try and hunt the F4U. And then I'm aware of another RB-17. I switch targets and I go for that. And as you can see, the game has, as I predicted, flipped right round. We're now 4-1 up. Well, prior to the advent of the CIS players, being 4-1 down would be a situation in of some considerable concern, it's not so anymore. As I kill the RB-17, I'm knocked down by the KI Key 84, I think, uh, Key 93. I've looked at the minimap, minimap before I spawned in. I chose to spawn at the original location because I could see on the garrison to the left there was one of the RB-17s. And he's coming out like a bat out of hell, but straight towards me. On half health, so it's an easy kill. not my kill, something else has destroyed him. Not quite sure what. One of my teammates must have been below me. And now the game has flipped round again. We're full one down. There is zero defence by the CIS players. And they do not play tactically. And that's pretty maddening, frankly. But it also means that the game's not a, a, a loss at this stage flown into the middle to try and uh, take a sector and I've seen the P61 so I'm ignoring most targets to see if I can catch him unawares and I'm a little bit lucky he isn't aware of me I get on his tail then he goes again now the human player in the P47 has another go with rockets and this time not really surprisingly he misses and I can now turn this aircraft so despite the fact it's turned for me he's a goner provided his friends don't interfere. He tries a smart move, he drops bombs there, but I see them going and I pull straight up after shooting down. They blow up harmlessly, and that puts me on the back of a ground attacker. Put a lot of damage into that. I'm glad the notification goes through. I then see the Key 93 that dropped me down. I know it's a pop, but it could easily turn and shoot me down again. So I dispose of that, and now I'm coming back for the ground attacker. Finish that off. I look ahead of me, and for the third time in the game, the P61 hasn't looked at me. He's after something else. I swing round, starts manoeuvring. This is a typical manoeuvre of a CIS player. They tend to go up and over rather than round and round. 
Okay, he's trying to make me switch, switch between yours. Well, I can do that. He's being hit by my rear gunner anyway, and now he gives up realising he's lost the fight, even though he takes my engine. I finish him off, and I put the engine back in quickly, and it's a good job I did, as you'll see in a moment. Now, I didn't notice it at the time, but the red blob that was directly ahead of me was the meteor. I have to look back and work out what it is, realise what it is, I can outturn a meteor. Now my pilot is injured, comes back in, I'm not sure whether that's because I use the medical kit it is, I think, rather than the resilience skill, because I don't think I've got it on this pilot. And as you can see, I've comprehensively outturned meteor, and down he goes. And they have two aircraft left. It's been a, a very seesaw sort of battle. See Terminator and Cyrillic with me. I begin shooting him, and the jig's almost up before he can even re he react. Kosher, Kosher double medal goes through, and we're up to 19,000 person points. I don't let the first uh, ABA shoot me. I avoid. I take the second one, which is heavily damaged anyway, and now I'm on the tail of the first one. Push that off, and temporarily we've got superiority. I lose the sector almost immediately, but by now we've won the game. There we go. A quick fire victory with 20,000, nearly 21,000 personal points and quite a few medals. Before I review the outcome of this battle, let me sound a note of caution. There are bonuses in effect. It's a times five day and this was the first minute of the day and also there are bonuses coming from these various signs uh, um, in the candy trail. And as we can see, we have a five chevron battle, a grade one heavy fighter if you prefer, and this grows to 441,099 credits or silver, uh, of which 131,000 approximately came from a premium account bonus, and there's another 50,000 or so coming from the other bonuses I've just mentioned. So this figure is inflated. It's true also for the experience, which is base 5,722, premium account bonus of 2,861, sign of the owl coming from the candy trail, another little bit there, and then other bonuses kicking in with the vast majority of this figure, 47,032. And true free experience as well, 2,666 base, 143 coming from a premium account bonus, and other bonuses there contributing 280. Three tokens, all for first medals of the day, the Kosha Dub, the Hero of the Sky, and the Winged Legend. There they are. Let us turn to the personal score tab, and we can see that all of the uh, two of the class-specific missions were complete, and a three-fifths of the attack aircraft and bombers destroyed mission was complete, and that garnered enough points to get the five chevrons. That was 20,865 personal points with three sectors captured, 19 aerial targets destroyed, one short of the ace there, 11,757 damage to aerial targets with 35 criticals, criticals a feature of this game now, lost the aircraft twice, it was a competitive battle, uh, capture points 520 and that was split 240 for defending, 280 for attacking. We turn to the team score tab, we can see that was enough for first place both by chevrons and personal points on my team, would have been so on both teams. Um, good efforts coming in from plenty of the players here, there are a lot of players in the game now with the uh, advent of the CIS players, 11,000 here, 11,000 here, 10,000 here, all good. Uh, excellent contribution from the CIS player in the opposing P61, I was pretty lucky to come across him at, uh, with an advantage I think three times. Uh, IL-20 doing the best out of the rest of the team. Uh, the odd B-17s, I did go after them quite a bit, but those scores were a little bit on the low side, and that's probably why we won. I'm very happy with this battle. That brings me to the end of this look at the Northrop P-61 Black Widow. This is a plane with slightly low DPS, but as you've seen in this video, you can compensate for that. Ordinary speed and also only one equipment slot on the engine, which means it doesn't admit of a speed build in the way that other heavies do, or most of the other tier 8 heavies do. However, it's got excellent maneuverability, good altitude performance, and I think many people are going to regard this aircraft as overpowered. I think it's a little bit too soon to say that, but it's easy to fly, and I think it is a very strong plane. Well, I hope you found that interesting, and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. But until then, this is the Noble Cube, signing out.